Hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you are listening to The Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm chatting with Kyle Denhoff. Kyle is a marketer, copywriter, and a former professional lacrosse player. He is currently the director of new media at HubSpot, where he is focused on building the HubSpot podcast, creator, and YouTube networks to help guide growing businesses. In this conversation, we do an enormous deep dive into the details on these programs, defining what thinking like a media company means and where it applies and where it doesn't, the nuts and bolts of how to make YouTube work from a financial and monetization perspective, entry points for businesses looking to get into more media initiatives without basically overhauling their entire strategy and producing tons of series, like we talk about basic entry ways to get into these programs. Anyway, this conversation was great. It was the most clarity I think I've ever received on uh, media strategy at B2B businesses. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Kyle Denhoff. Really popular statement today. Every company is a media company. Mm-hmm. What thoughts come to mind when you hear that? What are your thoughts on this statement? I think so. I've, I've heard it and I know there's a lot of opinions on it. I think you should invest in owned media if it's part of your strategy. I don't think every company needs to be a media company. I think small and mid sized regional businesses don't necessarily have to invest in a ton of media. I think a lot of um, direct to consumer brands can actually acquire customers through social advertising. I think you see a lot of the larger companies like Apple, for example, I know they've moved into movies and TV, but before that they were able to sell plenty of products without being a media company. And so I think it's just another level or lever and strategy that businesses can pull on, which is, can I build an owned audience and then ultimately monetize that audience? And I think if your leadership team is interested in doing that and committed to doing that, it's something that can pay off for you over time. Um, so I think folks could, should consider it, but I do think it depends on the product or service you're selling, the size of your company and, and really who your audience is. Yeah, it's probably my perception just because I work with SaaS brands at Omniscient mm. and HubSpot is a SaaS brand, uh, worked yeah. at HubSpot, right? Um, and I may, I see the chatter more in maybe like the B2B space. So I wonder if there's something specific about that kind of space where people are like maybe questioning the existing kind of content paradigms and thinking about like what what new and emerging trends there are. Yeah, yeah. I think in the B2B space, like you have your core growth plays, right? That worked for quite a long time. I think B2B companies invested in SEO and blogging and acquiring customers through organic search and ultimately converting them into leads for the business. Um, we obviously all invested in Facebook and Google ads and mastered PPC to be able to acquire new customers, but there's a couple things that are happening. One, I think there are consumer shifts that are happening. More people are on social video. YouTube just passed Netflix as the top streaming platform in the United States. You have Substack with over, I think, 200,000 paid subscribers, something like that. But there's a shift happening where people aren't just going to Google for their information. They're going to these other platforms to consume news and education and media. And so if there's this consumer shift happening, now the B2B marketers are saying, oh, crap, like, where's my audience now? I need to be able to meet them there. And so we're seeing this shift in our strategy, which is how do we keep those ongoing plays that have worked for us for years? And then how do we reinvest in these new channels uh, and media plays to reach those potential customers? And and that's where I think that's a really good point. And I want to dive into that later. Um, yeah. I think that's one gap that I see a lot of B2B SaaS companies dealing with is these mm-hmm. new channels, they're a much different format. It's like yeah. the Marshall McLuhan, the media is the message or medium is the message. Mm-hmm. And it's like competing on YouTube, you're going up against Mr. Beast and a bunch of, you know, like very sure. entertaining creators and applying maybe the same model that you would use for educational content doesn't seem to work. But just first, just humor me. I'm, I'm a bit pedantic. So I want to, I always think like with marketing, there, there's so much new, there's buzzwords, there's like new things, there's new shiny objects. Sure. And I, my, my thought always goes to like, is this really new? And like, when I hear yeah. the media company thing, I'm like, you know, wasn't HubSpot technically kind of doing this with the blogging in the mid two thousands? Weren't a lot yeah. of brands doing this by creating like original content on social media? 
I guess like, is this new or is there like a new paradigm <laughs> shift within what, like, what is media, yeah, you know, like yeah. wasn't blogging media? Yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great question. I'm, I'm smiling because there's a, a book in my office called a master class on brand planning. And it's all these white papers from J. Walter Thompson back in the seventies and eighties. And I reference it all the time because the foundation of marketing and advertising has not changed. It's the way that we deliver that message has changed. And so I think you're absolutely right. The HubSpot blog has been up and running for over a decade. We get more traffic than large media sites um, like Harvard Business Review, entrepreneur.com, inc.com. We've been investing in that written form of content. And I think social has obviously played a big, big role in reach and media. But we're expanding as marketers, we're expanding our, our portfolio of content and trying to reach audiences in these different formats. And we need to figure out, can we take that SEO based education approach from the blog and apply it to all these new channels? Or do we need to reformat and rethink how we how we send our messages out? And I think that's what we're learning is we have to reformat it. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's not new. We're just shifting our focus. And I think learning a little faster how to work in these new channels. And I feel like there's also this, it, like maybe there's a new mental model that we need for some of these new channels and, and new ways mm -hmm. to reach customers. Because... I'm sure this was the case in the early days of SEO, but nowadays you can really map out the customer journey and figure out somebody's probably coming in with this keyword with a very low level of information. They're probably yeah. not aware of the problem even. And then this keyword, right? It's very bottom funnel. It's like they're searching for a solution. You you have a crystal clear map of where these kind of topics fit into the customer journey. Whereas I feel like that may be a little bit less clear with say YouTube video creation, right? Like it's a little bit, maybe I just don't have the mental map yet for some of these new yeah. spaces. Yeah. I think you have to think through the intent, like you mentioned, I, you know, you, what's great about YouTube in particular is people, it's such a large platform and people go there for many different reasons. Folks are going there for news. They're going there for entertainment. They're going there for education really to learn something um, but they also go there to learn about products right there's product unboxing videos and review videos and tutorial videos and so at least the way that we've started to approach it is okay who's the audience we're trying to reach what channel are we going to use to reach that audience in youtube and then what are the different content formats that we need to create to reach them to your point based on where they are in the buyer's journey if we're just trying to reach a mass audience of people who work in business at SMBs and mid-sized companies, we may go with more of like a news or commentary style video as opposed to a product tutorial because they're they're not in the market to buy yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we're looking to capture demand that's out there where people are searching, how do I set up automation inside of HubSpot? How do I build my website on HubSpot? We can create product tutorial videos, place them on YouTube, and ultimately capture that audience um, for our sales team. So I do think it depends on like what's the overall objective, and then how can we create a piece of content that maps to that objective. And YouTube really allows you to, to span that full customer journey. Other channels don't necessarily have that flexibility. I think newsletters are difficult. I think social obviously is is pretty difficult when you're talking about the product itself. Podcasts, um, right? That fits podcasts, into, into a weird exactly, space. Exactly. Exactly. So we've been trying to figure out, okay, as we build out this funnel, this customer journey, what media investments are we making at each point? Um, and what role does that media property have in our in our funnel? Um, you're your title at HubSpot now is Director of New Media. Yeah, that's right. What does that mean? <laughs> so I uh, I currently oversee our new media properties. So you had mentioned earlier that the HubSpot blog has been up and running for quite some time. And that's an incredibly established and mature team. Um, I'm leading our podcast network, our YouTube network, and what we call our creators program, which is where we do sponsorship and licensing deals with independent creators. And this is very new for HubSpot. We've been building these properties uh, over the last two years. And so I was uh, put in this position to be able to build up new production teams uh, to launch these new media properties for the business and, and ultimately try to figure out how can we build audience and then monetize audience through through audio and video. 
Very exciting. So I want to talk about each of those uh, separately, the creator, uh, the YouTube and the podcast network. But yeah. first, um, you started out at HubSpot working on lead generation campaigns, correct? That's right. Yeah. How does that, how does that model of content marketing, does that still stand up in the modern era? Or how do you feel about, I guess, the transition from your personal experience going from lead generation, which I assume includes gated assets, yeah. um, you know, ebooks and, and web, you know, like anything that kind of collects an email, uh, gets them into the funnel where you, you start nurturing campaigns uh, up to the point where they're a customer. How, how does that stand up and how does that fit into the modern kind of content playbook? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we're applying the old playbook to some of our new channels and and properties, but to our earlier discussion, like it doesn't doesn't necessarily fit perfectly. I think if you were on a podcast and you say, "Hey, go over to HubSpot.com and download this ebook," uh, the conversion rate is probably going to be pretty low. So we know that podcasting is more of a brand awareness play uh, for the business, and so we're trying to figure out. How do we use podcasts to provide education and expert commentary to our audience? And then can we place HubSpot brand advertisements in the show itself for more of an awareness play uh, to stay top of mind with our audience? On YouTube, on the other hand, we have figured out how to uh, drive demand through YouTube. So you imagine when someone's sitting down at their computer watching a YouTube video, sometimes they have two screens open. On one screen, they're watching the YouTube video, and on the other screen, they're trying to learn how to do something themselves. So we do a lot of videos that are educational and tutorial, and within the YouTube description, you can ask people, click on this link to go get additional value or take the next step in your journey. And we've come up with a nice formula to be able to drive viewers to HubSpot.com to then take a next step, whether that be download a piece of content or sign up for a product. Um, and I think if you can if you can make that match from the video to the value add on your website really tight um, and, and something that the viewer is excited about, uh, you'll be able to, to use the old playbook on new platforms. I could see YouTube being much less of a, a Wild West thing, right? Like there's a lot more mm -hmm. robust analytics. Like it just feels like people have figured it out to uh, a greater extent than some of the other initiatives. I still want to talk about like YouTube and we, we have tons of clients who are curious about YouTube, uh, especially yeah. as an expansionary play from content SEO. Um, yeah. First, I'm curious about the creator program though. Can you tell me about just maybe high level, like what the HubSpot creator program looks like, what the goals are? What you're yeah, working absolutely. on with the creator program so i think one thing that we're just like seeing is a shift as, in, in audience consumption is people are gravitating towards personalities right they are gravitating towards entertainers they are gravitating towards experts that's how they're consuming their content they're following people not necessarily publishers or brands and so we wanted to make sure that we were investing in those folks in the business category. And so a couple of years ago, we started to talk about this idea of a creator program where we're investing in independent podcasters and YouTubers to bring their content into our media network, uh, but also giving them the editorial freedom to, to continue creating. The best consumer example I have for folks is a, like a helpful framework I share is Netflix. So you have a Netflix account, and when you log in, there are Netflix originals, which are movies and TV shows that they produce in-house. And then there's additional content, TV series, documentaries, movies that they've licensed to bring into the app. We're doing that at a much smaller scale. So we have teams at HubSpot that are solely focused on HubSpot originals, original podcasts, original blogs, original newsletters. But we have this HubSpot creators team that's reaching out to podcasters in the business category, YouTubers in the business category and saying, can we form a long-term partnership one year, two years where we're co-producing videos together and we'll obviously compensate you for that and support you. And in addition, we're licensing your content to come into to HubSpot.com. And so those relationships have been very successful for us. It's allowed us to scale our reach and demand uh, pretty dramatically over the last 12 months. It sounds like the so the word creator. It sounds like you don't have like a very specific like a creator is not like a podcaster. It's not a YouTuber. It's just a person who's creating content and has an audience. I'm guessing there's platforms that they tend to thrive on. Like the, there's probably bloggers in the program, podcasters. But how do you um, 
how do you encapsulate like the creator economy, if you will? Yeah, I think when you're when you're reading all the information about the creator economy, you're seeing everything from TikTokers and Instagram influencers to folks who have their Substack newsletters. I think we're mostly interested in folks who have their own media property and an established audience. So we're talking to folks who have been podcasting for quite some time. They've grown uh, downloads and have a following. Um, same thing with YouTubers. So we're engaging with YouTubers who have a, a pretty good subscriber base. Every time they publish a new video, there's an engaging audience there. Um, and we're talking about newsletters uh, in the future. And so we, I will say like our definition of creator is definitely someone who's kind of an independent media entrepreneur. They've built this media asset and their business is, is growing an audience. Um, now to your question around like people who create content in different mediums, a lot of the folks we've started to work with, the podcasters or the YouTubers, they have email lists. They mm. also have a great social following. And we set up our program to be more like channel specific, but now we're needing to rethink that. How do we do a more holistic partnership with this creator who can provide us business content, uh, but also distribute that in multiple forms of media. Um, and so that's something we're tackling next year. How do you pick creators? I know, I know that's a broad <laughs> question, but like, what is yeah. like a good candidate for somebody that you would work with? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it, I think it starts overall with the HubSpot business strategy. So we're looking at what are the core business objectives and who are the audiences that HubSpot, the software company is trying to reach. And then what are the channels that we can use to reach those audiences? And so we're trying to reach entrepreneurs, marketers, salespeople, SMB and mid-sized companies. And so then we'll take the next step of, okay, what are the most popular podcasts or YouTube channels that talk about topics in that given category? Um, we'll do an analysis of those channels. We look, we actually have kind of an internal scoring rubric hmm. um, where we're looking at um overall editorial angles and uh, creativity, the talent um, within the show, the host themselves, the production quality. Is this something you know we're excited to stand behind? Um, have they seen growth over the last uh, three months, six months? Is this you know a show that they're actively investing in? Um, do they support our DI and B goals as a network and as a company? And so we go through our full rubric and then we start to like rank. Hey, these are shows we'd really like to work with that will fill a gap in our content portfolio. Um, and then we reach out to them and, and start a discussion. But there definitely is a system for evaluating shows um, because we're not, it's not media buying. We're not doing a 30 day sponsorship, a 60 day sponsorship. We want to build a one or two year partnership with folks. And so there's an evaluation that goes into it. So that longer term partnership is really interesting to me. One, because I think it is very different than how most people may think about working with influencers. Sure. But two, because I would imagine... So there's there's like two sides of like how to pick, I guess, talent to work with. At mm -hmm. the extremes, there's like finding people who already have massive audiences because there's less risk to it. But I would mm -hmm. imagine the cost is priced in, right? They understand the value of their audience. And in fact, like they may want to just keep that value for themselves. It's probably a lot harder to break into that. And then there's the other side. It's like it's like buying like a, a growth stock versus like, you know, a safe bet or something like that. Yep. Picking somebody who seems to have potential and growing along with them, giving them the resources, helping them with distribution and maybe content creation to a certain extent. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure you have a mix of strategies there, but like how do you think about that distribution of like taking earlier bets on promising creators versus mm -hmm. buying priced in talent with already existing audiences. Yeah. I think like it, it obviously depends on, on your goals and your size of your company. Um, I think we're very fortunate at HubSpot to have a marketing budget where we can talk to some larger established shows. Um, but we also can't build an entire podcast network on large established shows. As you mentioned, it would become mm -hmm. too costly. And so a year ago, we launched what we called our um, uh, emerging program, where we opened up an application for podcasters to apply, and they had to provide us with their show, their their download numbers, um, their vision for the show's growth, 
And then we actually went through a process of evaluating them and we started to invest in podcasts that are up and comers. So they're folks we know have talent because we've listened to the show. Uh, we think their editorial angle and taste is, is very unique and, and a voice that we want in our network. Um, we believe that it has high chance of, of growth. We think the impact can be, be there long term. And so we invested in eight podcasts last year um, with the understanding that it will take 12 months to 24 months to grow them. Um, but we have a team actually dedicated to supporting them and providing them guidance. The one thing that I think is really cool about what we've built is we have a network. We now have 35 shows in our network and they can support each other with cross promotions or guest swaps. Um, and so some of those emerging creators are getting support from the larger shows. Uh, and we've really found that community to be really beneficial for the shows themselves. Very cool. I, I want to stick mainly to the business side of things, but I am curious yeah. about the creator side, just because you've had a lot of exposure to maybe some of these earlier ones and like you've got the program and the resource to help nurture them. What, how, how do you nurture? Like what, what are, what are your tips for creators? Like what, what do you see creators doing wrong that kind of keeps them prevents their success? And like, what, what do you, how do you nurture a creator into kind of greater success? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of it is education and resources. So um, we have, you know, producers in house on our HubSpot Originals team who have done like lunch and learns with creators to help them through their segments and their audio editing and things of that nature. The biggest place where we've seen folks struggle or hit a plateau in growth is they try to diversify too quickly. So the they're trying to take their podcast and launch something new on YouTube and launch a newsletter and try to get social going. And it's too much all at once. And we recognize all those channels have value in helping you grow an audience. But until you're able to really nail that repeatable format and the podcast that's going to be successful, you want to wait to, to grow into other channels. And I think the creators who have been thoughtful in their expansion onto other channels have seen that long-term growth. Um, so really just focusing the resources you have on one media property and, and making it work. Yeah. I love the idea of focus and uh, mm -hmm. as a follow-up. So I, I sometimes think that I have too much of an engineering or like analytical mindset with some of this stuff. So like I can sure. reverse engineer to a certain extent wor what works in search engine optimization, but sometimes mm -hmm. with, with creators and, and just, more creative endeavors in general. Sometimes I wonder if it's a little bit of catching lightning in a bottle, you know, like sure, you could follow sure. some other person's playbook and it might not work for some secret underlying emergent ingredient that mm -hmm. you just don't have, right? Like, do you, does that resonate at all? Or is there, oh, is there any sure. sort of framework of playbook that yeah. one could follow to grow their reach? Or is this just the right place, right time, right voice, right fit? Yeah. Yeah, I think honestly, those those are the uh, those are the inputs that go to it. Is like, is do you have strong opinions? Do you, do you offer something that that's not in the market today? I think a lot of B two B content marketers follow the same playbook, so we see a lot of the same content. Um, and I think that the creators that are out there with a little bit of a different art direction, a little bit of a different opinion, um, creating something specifically for like a niche audience that they know well, and they're speaking their language and they're part of that culture, they'll see more success. But we've had this debate internally at HubSpot is like, you know, how do you teach editorial taste? It's, yes. it's really hard. It's really hard because we can put together the marketing strategy and we can put together the playbook and the formula. But if that host and that that um, content isn't spot on, it won't stick. People, people will watch or listen and they'll leave. Um, I will say for a lot of our in-house shows, so the shows that we produce ourselves, we'll launch a limited run. So we'll say, hey, we're going to commit to this podcast and we're going to do eight or 10 episodes. And then we're going to, in those eight or 10 episodes, we're going to try a couple different things. We're going to try a new opening segment. We're going to try a guest. We're going to try a debate. And we're going to then evaluate the performance of that content and see which topics, um, guests, and formats had the highest viewership or listenership. Um, and then from there, we can refine the show itself. And I will say for our, our originals team, it's frustrating. <laughs> the mm -hmm. first three to 
three to six months, they're like, oh man, that, that was a flop. That one didn't work. No one, no one listened past the 40 second mark on that one. Um, but then you learn, right? You test it and you learn. And then eventually I do believe, you know, the right production teams will find a formula that works. Uh, and these media properties will grow over time. But that brings me to just one point I want to make for, for marketers, which is if you're going to, if you're going to commit to media, it really has to be a long-term commitment. Um, mm-hmm. If you're looking for sales in the next 30 days or 60 days, or you want to fill your lead pipeline in the next quarter, go run ads or host an event or come up with a campaign. Uh, but if you want to be able to build audience long-term uh, and stay top of mind, I think media is really a 12, 24 month investment uh, plus. We, we should probably just hammer that point home for almost every initiative. I actually had this tweet. Uh, it was like, I wrote it a year or two ago and it, it goes like viral every six months or so because somebody reposts it. It's something like concept marketing is like gardening and, and paid acquisition is like hunting. If you want fast leads, use paid ads. If you want like, yeah. you know, long-term leads, use content. And I, it, it has the elements of a viral tweet, but like whenever I see it, I'm like, if I could get fast leads from paid, like I would do, everybody would do that. It's not, it's like, it's, <laughs> sure, nothing's that sure. simple, you know, <laughs> no, but definitely no. with media, a hundred percent. Like I, I totally agree with you, but like, I, there's so many people who are like, Oh, I need it right now. And it's like, you know, if there were an answer for that, like, I think a lot more people would just do that thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really think like the mix is helpful, right? The fact, especially at HubSpot, like, our paid team, paid acquisition, their ads will perform well when the brand and media teams are expanding our reach and, and folks are consuming our content. And we we don't necessarily have a direct attribution to that. Like more people are listening to podcasts, so the uh, direct response ads are doing better. But I do think that mix is like we're known in the market, people are hearing our brand, there's higher awareness, and therefore when it's time then they're in the market for software. They're seeing the ads about our features and products and they're clicking on them. And so I do think the best marketing plans, whether it's a small business or a large company, have that right mix is like Mm -hmm. brand and media and direct response acquisition. Do you think there is a certain stage or maturity or type of company that a media strategy would work best for and, and maybe conversely brands who maybe shouldn't focus on it, at least right now? Yeah, I imagine it comes down to like... size of company and revenue like you you need to early on like startup phase you got to sell the product right like gotta get some customers you got to get some customers so i don't think you want to sit down and say i'm going to now invest in this youtube channel uh i think you want to i think you want to work on your pricing page and your your uh packaging and and get out there in events and introduce your product uh to those potential customers and get some sales and get some momentum and revenue coming in And then once you feel like you have good footing and good market fit, then it's like, okay, how am I going to diversify my marketing strategy and really try to like build long-term pipeline? And that's when I, I think when you're at that point, you're like, okay, I think a media property really is going to help me long-term. And like earlier in our conversation, right? HubSpot's blog is 14 years old, something like Mm -hmm. that. They made that bet early and it's paying off today. And so I just think they obviously found market fit launch that blog and then it brings in you know steady traffic and leads for the team over time and i think you just need to get past that initial startup phase until you have market fit and then it probably makes sense to invest in one media property it does feel too that a lot of this stuff is synergistic and maybe um the foundations and that's kind of a generic word they help the media initiatives uh, kind of extract more value. So like maybe a media initiative on its own could be successful, but not as successful as if you had the pieces in place, such as the blog, such as all the lead generation. HubSpot has an affiliate program. You know, like there's a ton of things that like you can add on as the base layer. So like as you're attracting all that additional attention, it's not just attention. Like there's a way to actually capture the value from all of that. Um, So it does seem like there is these things play together, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think like you could go the other way where you establish a media property first and try to build an audience and then sell to that audience, right? Which is where the creators have actually started to generate more revenue because they built audience first and then they monetized it. 
I just think if you're a, a B2B company or you're selling a product or service, you probably just don't have that luxury where you're like, I'm going to build an audience over two years and then I'll finally sell my product to them. Um, probably in some unique use cases, but you're exactly right. As like, you have to figure out what are my foundational plays that can bring in consistent, um, consistent leads and sales for my team uh, and then build on top of it. That's a really good point. And I think they are in some ways, two totally different mindsets. Like I, mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, I'm doing a podcast and like it does have some listeners, but I don't sure. think that I could be a YouTube creator. I mean, I'm sure if I spent like a year or two and really figured out the formula and tested a bunch of stuff, like maybe that would work, but it would yeah. require almost all of my focus. I couldn't do it at the same time that I'm also, uh, you know, setting up slide decks and like build, you know, like doing sales yeah. presentations managing for clients, and doing client yeah. works, managing. Yeah. It wouldn't be feasible for me to do those things at the same time. However, I I know how to convert. Like I know how to monetize. Like that's the, my skill set. There is totally fine. So I, I feel like there may be an argument towards like if you want to get into this and maybe you haven't established a large presence, like partnering with the people who have built an audience and maybe you have trouble monetizing it, right? Yeah. Because like your job as a B two B marketer, it's to me, it's very difficult to think like, how do I capture somebody's attention? How do I entertain? How do I like sure. compete with Mr. Beast and all these people on YouTube? Sure. I don't have that mindset. So it's like that other person who's focusing all their time and attention on that, that partnership may be the, the kind of key into that, that initiative. Yeah. I think that's a great point because we like, we have incredible writers and producers at HubSpot that are making the content and they have a partner that is working on monetization. How do we convert that audience into demand for the business? I also think we're seeing that with independent creators. Um, some folks that that we work with or we've reached out to, they're actually partnering with small like operation shops now where they're saying like, I want to be a creator. I want to focus on my videos or my show or my newsletter, and I need help on the monetization side. And so there's actually like boutique agencies and shops out there that are saying, we'll help you establish your email list. We'll help you monetize that list through digital courses or ad sales. And I think like you mentioned the creator economy before, it's not just sponsorship and advertising deals. Like folks are trying to figure out how do I have paid subscriptions? How do I have my own product line? Um, and there's a ton of companies that are out there. If you're a brand, that's an opportunity, right? So if there's someone who is a podcaster or YouTuber in your category, they're not, they don't have to be huge, right? They're just an expert in your field. Maybe you can approach them and say, hey, is there an opportunity here where we can provide you with the operational support and some capital to, to grow your, your show, but you focus on making, making your content? Um, and partnerships could be lucrative for both sides. I love that. Um, here's a speculative, speculative question for you. Um, sure. This is going to depend on the industry, but let's say that MarTech in general, it's pretty saturated in SEO right now. Other spaces, that's not the case. Like there's been clients we've worked with where it's pretty open field. How close do you think we are to the saturation point in the creator economy for, let's say, SaaS right now? How much room do you think there's left to grow? Like how many creators can there be? Yeah. That's a really good question. Like what's the what's the market there and who are we who are we partnering with? I do think it does dep it depends on the medium. I think that you know in the podcast space for example, it's incredibly hard to grow. There's not a discovery mechanism there. It's like hard for people people don't just go to Apple Podcasts and Spotify and just search for new topics and episodes. They come across it because they're a podcast listener and someone recommended the show or they found it on social. So I think podcasts are, are pretty saturated. You have your, your big podcast networks and your larger independent shows. And so I think they, they have a pretty good stronghold there. I think there's a ton of green space on YouTube. Mm -hmm. You could, you could go on YouTube. There's a, a gentleman who has a YouTube channel focused solely on product photography and videos millions of subscribers, millions of views, and he's just teaching people how to do product shoots. Um, and it's like a really carved out niche. And you could go on there and learn how to like build a, a small motion graphic for your product in Canva or shoot it on your iPhone 14. And he's carved out that, that audience and he's providing value. I think so many people use YouTube and there's so much um, natural discovery built into the platform that brands or independent creators just have a lot of opportunity there to to carve out a space and own it. 
Um, on the social side, I think obviously we're we're bombarded with with content all day, and I think it's a little harder to break through there. You don't think there's any more room for more AI guys on LinkedIn? <laughs> There is a ton of, uh, honestly, the challenge is like, I don't know who to listen to. I think there's a couple of them that are, you know, working their way to the top, but there's so much coming at you and it's all the same content. Um, so yeah, I, it's because uh, my really first million, they talk about how to build a newsletter. It's, it's, but you guys are partially to blame for this. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are, we're encouraging folks. We're encouraging too many folks to start doing it. <laughs> I, so jokes, I, I agree with you on the YouTube um, stuff because I think my first, my first thought on YouTube is to be splashy, consumer focused, like very viral. Mm -hmm. um, but if I look at my own behavior on YouTube, I have tons of esoteric. Like, there's a couple examples that came to mind when you were talking about these niches. And there's one guy that I subscribe to. He's he's called the Punk Rock MBA, and he'll do oh. these like historical breakdowns of different movements that are punk rock and punk rock adjacent. And he'll sprinkle them with his business lessons as well. And it's very fascinating because it combines sort of two of my interests and yeah. it's entertaining as well as educational. And then there's sure. this other guy, like he just does these breakdowns of popular songs and it's really technical and advanced music theory. Nothing you would yeah. ever suspect to go viral, but the guy's got sure. millions of views on each video. And I'm like, mm -hmm. wow. And then another one, like I just bought this, um, the Roomba competitor. I can't remember what it's called. One yeah. of those robot vacuums. And I couldn't figure yeah. out how to set it up. So I looked up a YouTube video to figure out how to set it up. And again, a stunning amount of views on yes. this person's content. And it's just tons of tutorials on how to, how to mm -hmm. do technical things. <laughs> yeah. The technical ones, um, I've had a similar experience. Uh, my wife and I purchased a home last year and we've had some home projects and being living in a city and being in an apartment, I didn't have to be handy, right? Like, I go to YouTube for any home project and you'll find handyman on there with hundreds of thousands of subscribers and millions of views showing you how to do this paint technique or how to do this lighting installation or how to put in a ceiling. And it's not necessarily brands, right? You would assume Lowe's and Home Depot would, would have large channels with education, educational tutorials, and they do. Uh, but I do think there are folks that just find something they're an expert at they start creating videos that are helpful for people and they build an audience pretty quickly. I, I honestly do think that's really a really good point of advice for B2B brands. Again, I keep thinking about this because we have a ton of clients who are doing very well in search and content and are just thinking, all right, what's the next horizon? And they're thinking about YouTube. And again, like my inclination is also other people's, which is to go entertaining, to go creative, to go splashy. But I think yeah. content it, it can, like the utility of content could be that it's entertaining. It could also be that it's useful. And I think that Absolutely. does play well on YouTube. Absolutely. We, within our, within our YouTube network, um, the shows that we produce ourselves and some of the creator partnerships, they all have a different purpose. We have a vertical that's like news and expert commentary. We're not providing education. We're not teaching people about our software. We're just providing them perspective on things. Here's what's happening in business. Here's what's happening in marketing. Here's what's happening in sales and what we think about it as experts in that field. And that's just helpful information for folks, right? That are, that are operators in a business who are wanting to do a better job and help for other companies. And then you can kind of move down our, our funnel or our framework. And then there's people who want to know, like, how do I set up my first Facebook business page? I'll give you a tutorial on that. I'll show you how to set it up and best practices, but we're not selling the software. We're just helping people. And to your point, that utility aspect. So I think YouTube just lends itself to these different types of content and you can provide value in a lot of different ways. You don't have to go into specifics, but I would imagine that HubSpot and others, uh, other companies like HubSpot could partner with affiliates who are doing product tutorials, how to do let's take Jasper as an example, an AI copywriting tool. Sure. Um, there's a million use cases. It's actually one of those things. It's it's hard to kind of fully grok how to use it until you see it live. So mm -hmm. it's like the videos themselves could be done by creators, AI guy experts, right? And mm -hmm. they could just be like, hey, here's how I set up my workflow to build Facebook ad campaigns at scale. Yeah. And then you kind of like build the, like you can, you can promote the product during that, right? You're still doing your yeah. job as an affiliate marketer. I would imagine there's tons of cases for HubSpot, say, to partner with people who are MarTech experts and people who are talking about product reviews. And that's an easy monetization path for them. 
And obviously yeah. you as the brand are getting a lot more exposure from those people's audiences. Absolutely. The best, the best example of that type of content that I see on YouTube, you'd be so surprised how many people have videos up there for Google sheet functions and Excel functions and like just how to manage your database and run reports they, they are not entertaining videos, right? It is an expert sitting here who said, I had to build this model. Here's how I did it. Let me show you. And they have hundreds of thousands of views and it's a helpful, helpful utility. And B2B brands can do the same thing with their software. To your point, it's very visual. I want to understand how to build a website or set up automation or build a report, build a list. And so we're able to partner with our in-house team or solutions partners um, and say, hey, can you bring your expertise to YouTube and show our audience how you did that? Especially because there's some specific use cases. I think when you go to product pages, right, you have the great... Uh, sizzle reel video and the product positioning and the screenshots. But until you have that use case where it's like, okay, these are my three lead funnels and these are the three nurture streams that I need to build. And here's the messaging at each one. And here's the touch point until you see someone and are in the tool to build it yourself. I think it's difficult to like conceptualize. So we've seen a lot of success with our solutions partners and our in-house product team, just helping teach people and release those videos on YouTube. I love that style of content too, because it's like you get the additional distribution channel of YouTube, one of the largest search engines, but you can also yeah. use it in so many other places, right? You can use it in nurturing emails. You can put it on the website. Like there's so many other utilities of the same piece of content. Absolutely. That's one thing we've been talking about internally is like we, t and in our editorial meetings, sometimes we'll say like, who takes the lead? And there's an argument to be made that the video production team should take the lead on a piece of content because you can take that content and repackage it in so many different formats. So a HubSpot software product video can go on YouTube and get distribution, but our product team could actually use it and embed it within the software to help teach someone that's navigating to that section uh, of the, the product itself. It can go into our customer community. It could go into a customer email. It could get repackaged with a new intro and outro into a social video. And so I just think people, I mentioned at you know, the beginning of our discussion, this shift in consumer behavior, video is how people like to learn and consume things. And so I think these content marketing teams are going to want to shift to video first and then repackage things and push, push them out to your blog, your social channels and your product. Love that. Um, do you think about competition differently when you're thinking about media? So to mm -hmm. frame that question in a more concrete way, the SERPs are competitive among, you know, like the, you, you've probably got HBR and Forbes and G2 and like, there's a multitude of different companies, but really HubSpot for the main keywords is going to be competing against Salesforce, Marketo, Buffer, Similar companies that sell similar things, right? To a degree, mm -hmm. there's going to be news sites and like, but the SERPs generally, it's going to be a relatively finite amount of competitors with yeah. media. And I guess it depends how you define it, which we've gone into multiple different definitions of this. It doesn't have to be a big splashy thing. But uh, David, my co founder, David Kim, yeah. and I yeah. talked on a previous podcast and he referenced this, um, this old MailChimp documentary. I don't remember when they put that out, but, um, it just got us thinking. It's like, all right, so a MailChimp documentary doesn't necessarily just compete against HubSpot or other email marketing tools. It also kind of competes against the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary on Netflix. <laughs> it also sure. competes with The Bear on Hulu, right? Like when, when you're mm -hmm. getting into this territory, maybe your competitive landscape for attention expands yeah. too. And I'm wondering if, if that resonates with you at all. Yeah. Yeah. MailChimp Presents was the program where they were developing original podcasts and documentaries and video series, beautiful productions. Um, I think they're still, still up on their site. The, I think where we look at competition is you're absolutely right. As we go up and we generally say like the altitude of the content, if we're going into general like pop culture topics and news we know that we're no longer competing with people who are in the market to buy software. Our competitors become the publishers, uh, not necessarily the software brands. And then I think as you move down in your, your content development and you move into the education vertical and you move into the product tutorial video vertical, now you're competing with your direct competitors, right? And so I think as you move further away from the software, 
that that competition for for attention widens uh, and becomes more competitive. And so I think it's really up to your your marketing team to figure out where do we want to play? What space do we want to play in? Um, I think you should really always start with the product and then expand from there. So the reason I say that is if you start with like news and documentaries, and then you want to gradually move that audience into the product and you haven't made anything yet, there's nothing to send them to. So I think brands that start with media that's built around the software and then take a step out from that into education and take another step out from that into entertainment or news uh, can really build a nice customer journey um, on any medium. Uh, so I think overall, like that's how we frame it is we do see ourselves as a publisher. And we think that because we're publishing news and expert commentary and some entertaining videos, we're competing with with business publications like Axios and TechCrunch and uh, HBR because they're talking about similar topics to us. Uh, but we know that when we're doing product tutorials, that's one-to-one, right? Like that's our software competitors. So um, I think we look at each type of content differently and and the competition changes based on the content type. That's, this is cool. Um, one question that I really wanted to ask you, w- which we've covered, is how brands yeah. should think about entering some of these spaces. Um, sure. And because like the, the way I'm kind of framing this is like uh, HubSpot is aspirational, which I think serves a, a key purpose for getting people to think about some of these things, but it can also be mm-hmm. daunting. Sort of like yeah. j- going to a jujitsu class and going up against a black belt and thinking you could do all the same moves. And all of a sure. sudden you're like, wait. <laughs> I don't actually know how to do this stuff, right? You yeah. kind of want to practice the basics first. So maybe to summarize some of this stuff, if you're going to create your own original media content, it seems like focusing closer to the product, potentially closer to the customer data that you've already got, not expanding too far outside of the altitude that would actually probably drive business results is a good focus. Yeah. And then secondarily, what I heard is... Um, consider partnering with people with audiences that are very similar to yours, who you also want to reach because the creation aspect involves a whole lot of risk and uncertainty. And if you don't have that muscle, it's something that does take time to develop. So those are two things. And do you agree with those? Is there anything else you would add for maybe, you know, like a series B, C, D startup who maybe has an SEO and a paid program and they're just thinking about like horizon two, what's on the next mountain. Sure. Yeah. Companies at that stage that have, you know, they probably have like a good product marketing team and a a growth team that's starting to figure out how to drive inbound. Um, I think educational and utility content makes sense because it can serve two purposes. You know, it doesn't have to be overly salesy where you're just talking about the product. You can provide value through commentary or education or perspective And that helps you with a lot of your brand goals, right? Like there's an audience coming here to listen to what you think and then how you approach problems. And then there's also like a natural progression where you can say, you know, if this is something you're trying to solve, there's actually this like product that can help you do it. And so I do think educational content does help you there. Um, I think news in your category, if it's it's niche enough, can also be helpful uh, to bring in an audience. Um, So I think that's where I'd start is like, make sure you have those foundational product teams and growth teams in place, and then try to build out that media engine that's a little more educational. Um, And the second question was about partnerships. And I think that's where we found the greatest opportunity. Because to your point, it's it's expensive and it's a commitment to build a media property. It's like, we, we have to produce this every week, every month, and like, it's a commitment to keep it going and grow audience and try new things. There are some folks that are fantastic at that already. And they've built an audience that you want to reach. What we've learned from working with creators is don't approach them as just like a one-time media buyer. The brand partners that drive them crazy come in and say like, how much is it? Can you just plug my product? Mm -hmm. And that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for stability. They're looking for partners. And I think brands really have an opportunity to approach creators and say, hey, we actually want to do a partnership with you for a long period of time. We want to provide you with with income to support your business. And in return, we'd like to co-produce some content with you and have some placements. 
And I think you're seeing creators actually reduce the number of brand deals that they're doing because it became too much. It's like, I'm just, I'm just promoting all these different products and services. Sure. I'm bringing in money, but it's a headache. And they're saying, I actually want to find one or two great partners that I can work with for a long time. And I think that's a tactic. A lot of brands have missed. Uh, I don't think they've taken that approach yet. That definitely resonates. Um, This is one of the clearest explanations of what media initiatives look like at a B2B company. So I just got to thank you for just actually opening up the curtain. And I feel like there's so much um, fog around this generally, Uh, just a lot of hype, a lot of different definitions. And I actually feel like this gave a lot of concreteness to it. So this is cool. Um, Would you want to do maybe, I I call them rapid fire questions, but they're really just like, you know, random questions to wind down. Yeah, that works for me. All right. Who do you admire professionally and why? Who do I admire professionally? That's a great question. One person, one person that I really ad- admire um, was a former boss and, and mentor of mine. Um, Preeti Sidhu. She is now, I believe, SVP of strategy at Cardinal Health. Um, she, when I, I joined a healthcare company at the time and we were just building up our marketing team, her and I were running digital marketing and I was incredibly impressed with the way that she thought about marketing and strategy. She was a clear communicator. Everything was very well organized and she made the right bets. Um, and she taught me how to navigate, uh, companies to get things done and and hit goals. And so I just, she's an incredible thinker. She was a great mentor. She was empathetic. And that was just someone that I really was lucky enough to learn from early in my career. And, and her, her and I have stayed in touch and she's obviously done some incredible things and moved into a leadership position at a large healthcare company. And um, I'm just so impressed with what she's built. And I think anybody who has an opportunity to work for a leader um, who is that impressive, you know, should take their time. Even if the work's a little frustrating at times, take the time to ask questions and observe and learn as much as you can, because it'll pay off long-term. Absolutely. What's your strangest productivity hack? Strangest productivity hack. Yeah. I'm not like, so it's really, it's really funny you ask that question. So at work, most people will tell you that I'm incredibly organized. I, I I tend to not miss deadlines. I deliver early. I send clear communications. Like every, I come off as a great project manager. I've been told. Um, all I have is the Things app and all my to dos. And all I'm doing is when something pops in my head, I immediately add it to the app and I put a date on it for myself. I don't have a sauna boards with like 16 tasks already written out. Um, so my hack is actually in the moment. Write it down. And then make sure your calendar is loaded with the priority tasks, and then you're shipping them and getting off, getting them out the door. Um, but that one always makes me laugh because folks assume I have, you know, some big project management board that I'm following, and really it's just a prioritized list. You, you and I are very similar in that way. I do the same thing with the dates and the uh, Google tasks, but then I. Mm-hmm. Um, Literally every morning, I write down three things that I'm going to do, and I underline one. And if I just get the one thing done, that's a good day that's for me. Win. So I'm actually paper and pen. Like it's the most that. analog basic system. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny. I think a lot of people talking about YouTube, right? You go on YouTube. There's so many productivity hack videos and all the apps. I really think the simple analog play, whether it's a piece of paper or you're using a simple to do app. I think those people tend to be the most productive because they're focused. They're like, this is what I'm doing today. Yeah. Just do stuff. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Um, If you could create your own category in Jeopardy, what would it be? And would you get every question right? Oh, goodness. That's a great question. It would probably be um, a category about the West Wing. Uh, Mm. It is absolutely my favorite show. I've watched it all the way through multiple times. Uh, I am sure I would forget a couple of the questions, but uh, it's definitely something that for some reason, it's like my background show. I've watched it for a long time. I love the the characters and the writing. Um, so if I was on Jeopardy, hopefully they'd have some questions about uh, the West Wing. Love it. I'm going to have to watch that. Uh, what talent would you most like to have? 
I would love to, uh, I would love to be able to sing or play an instrument. <clears throat> um, I think for me, I, you know, I grew up playing sports and I, I tend to be, uh, pretty athletic and I can play a lot of games and stuff like that. And I started playing violin early on and I actually played the drums for a little while in school. And then I just gave it up and I'm just so impressed with people who continue to do that in their lives. And, um, for me, it'd be like, I would want to be able to learn piano. Like if I could play piano, I think that'd be an incredible skill. I wish my parents made me learn the piano when I was a child. Like yeah, now it's right? so hard. It's so <laughs> if hard. I had just been, like I would have hated it. it as a kid, but like now I'm sure. like, oh, that would, I would have been so grateful for that. Yes, absolutely. What is something that you believe to be true about marketing that many people would disagree with you about? The kind of something that, you know, generally is generally believed, but I disagree with the contrary in question. Mm. You can tell why I don't every call this rapid should, fire anymore. Every every company should be a media company. I don't necessarily believe that to be true. I think it depends on your product service, uh, the company. I think the biggest thing for me is you see these these takes on LinkedIn or or podcasts or YouTube, and they tend they tend to lack depth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that I struggle with. Is you know you get the tips and the how tos and the hacks, but really it always depends it always depends what's your objective who's your audience what channels can you use to reach that audience and what content do you need to create on those channels to get them to take an action and so i think i would probably disagree with most like uh online guru twitter threads and linkedin posts we're, we're definitely anti uh twitter thread and linkedin <laughs> gurus here <laughs> they perform well though right so that's the thing they perform well they build the following i think the formats are good but i think a lot of the folks that are in you know in the day-to-day -day and uh working on those strategies they probably aren't spending as much time writing writing those high level pieces they're really focused on on their work and i think depth and and context matter Right. I'm going to cut that clip out. The people who are doing the work aren't, aren't writing these things. That's that's absolutely true. Um, what is a career choice that you considered but did not pursue? Uh, journalism. So I went to school for journalism, wanted to be a multimedia journalist. Uh, if I could, I'd work at the Times. I think that would be incredible. Um, so I took photography, web design, videography, and school. Um, and then I always joke that I sold out to start writing for brands. I started my career in um, at agency world and did a lot of SEO, content marketing, and bound marketing for small businesses and, and have been on the brand train ever since. Um, but for me, if if I had if I had the choice, and um, I think I I would go over and 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 be a journalist. I think they just do incredible work, and especially now there's a lot of noise online, and I think mm. we need the the credibility and the expertise there. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? Overrated virtue. It's oh. a good question. That one I'm gonna have to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got to think about that one. I don't know. That's fair. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. ask you an easier one. Um, okay. We've talked all about creators, YouTube, yep. podcasters. Who are you following right now? Who, who do you want to bring some prominence following? to? Well, I want to give a shout out to the HubSpot creators. Uh, so you should definitely check out the HubSpot Podcast Network. We have some incredible up and coming shows um, that are doing great work. Phil Agnew has a show called Nudge that's all about the psychology and science behind marketing. Um, Ross Simmons has Create Like the Greats. I think that's a fantastic show. Shine Online, Inclusion in Marketing. There's a lot of these up and comers that I love. Um, in regards to you know what I'm reading and consuming, um, there's a blog that's been up for a while called Ad Aged. Uh, George Tannenbaum was a creative director at Ogilvy, I, I believe, and uh, has since uh, moved out of the agency world and writes about his perspective on marketing and advertising and the English language. And I think he's hysterical. He has some uh, tough tough uh, opinions about the industry, but I do think rooted in all of his writing is the right approach and and how brands should approach communications uh, and sales. And so that's something that, that I've been reading every morning for the past couple of months. Very cool. 
All right. Um, is there anything I didn't ask you that we should bring up now? Um, you know, we, t- we talked a lot about like investments and thinking about content strategy. We, we didn't talk about measurement. Is that anything that like comes up with your customers is like, if I invest in YouTube or I invest in podcasts, like I don't actually measure it and attribute its value to my business. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought that was like a very complicated rabbit hole, but if you have some answers, okay. I would love to explore that. We're very uh, measurement focused as an agency. Um, that's mm-hmm. actually still kind of an anomaly in the content marketing and SEO space. And it's actually yeah. fundamentally easier to do so there. At least that's my perception. So sure. give me the rundown on attribution with media initiatives. Yeah. I think a lot of marketers are just facing a tough, a tough challenge right now with consumers shifting away from search and and the CPA is going up and we're trying to figure out how do we gain attention and attract people and then build leads and pipeline. And you can't say this person listened to this podcast episode, came to our website, downloaded this thing and talked to sales, right? Where we're just moving away from direct attribution. And so for us with our different media properties, they each have we, we generally look at uh, measurement in a framework of three. So they have a reach metric, they have an audience metric, and they have a demand metric. The reach metric is how many people are consuming the content. So for YouTube, it would be organic views on a given channel. Um, then they have an audience metric. Are, the subscri- are people watching our videos and subscribing to our channel so that we can reach them again and make them returning visitors? And then they would have a lead or a, a sign up number, the demand number, which is how many viewers are you converting into leads for the business? And I think that's how we approach each one of our media channels and podcasting, because it's you know not something where someone's going to have direct click attribution to your site. We have overall impressions or downloads of a given episode, and then you have followers on the Spotify and Apple uh, platform. The other thing that we've started to consider is trying to calculate the indirect monetization. So with our podcast, if we were to go to the open market and buy ads in a show in the category, Mm -hmm. there's a media kit there and a CPM to buy ads within that show. And so we'll actually apply a CPM value to our own shows. And we can say to marketing leadership and finance, Hey, this show produced X in value because its reach has been growing and we've applied a market rate CPM to the show. And you don't have to go out and buy ads with another show because we're building, we're building a presence and an audience ourselves. And so I think for marketers, it's, you know, reach audience demand. Um, and then if you're having trouble trying to validate the investments and in brand and reach, the CPM values come in handy for us. I love that CPM value. Yeah, that's very common in SEO. Um, if you don't have the proper attribution set up to just say, what would this have costed to do pay per click advertising for the same keywords? Yeah. Right. It's sort of a yeah. proxy for the value. But yeah, it's it's a challenging thing. I like to focus on leading indicators in some of these cases because mm-hmm. the whole philosophy on, around measurement for me is mostly you know measure what you can. It's it's almost a serenity prayer, right? It's like yeah, measure yeah. what you can, know what you can't, or know what you can to know the difference, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. It's, um, we were, I was having this discussion with someone a couple of weeks ago is you have to like, as a, as a brand or a marketer, there's a mix, right? There's going to be a mix of brand and media and direct response and acquisition. And you have to trust your instincts and say, you know, here's, here are my investments. My mix may be 60, 40, it may be 70, 30, but I'm going to commit to this mix because I believe that by having these branded media investments, the business will benefit over time. And so I think most marketers just need to sit down and say, you know, here's the mix that we believe will work for us at this point in time in our company uh, and commit to it uh, and adjust it as you go. hundred percent. All right. Coming up on time. Is there any other mentions, links, where can people find you online? Anything else yeah. you want to throw out to the audience? 
for further yeah, research? So I think for, for the audience, they can head over to blog.hubspot.com. We have redesigned the site and the navigation, and you can see the entire portfolio of media products there from YouTube channels to podcasts to newsletters. So I'd encourage folks to go there as we're, we're trying to provide more news and education. Um, and most folks uh, can follow me on X, I guess it's called now, or head over to LinkedIn uh, and follow me. Uh, hopefully we can connect. Still sounds weird uh, saying X, it does. right? It sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was excellent. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. 